originally from Toledo, Ohio, now fighting out of Phoenix, Arizona. This fighter is an All-American Collegiate Wrestling Champion, a World Valley Judo Championship Tournament winner, and a legendary Pride FC competitor. This fighter is also a two-time UFC Heavyweight Tournament winner with a professional record of 15 wins, 11 losses, and one no contest. Weighing in at 275 pounds, ladies and gentlemen, introducing Mark the Smashing Machine Kerr! One of the harder parts for me to adjust to life now is that I've lived the life I've lived that I've fought in front of 60, 70,000 people. Well, I've won world championships. I've been paid, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars to do it. And now I just live a regular life. You know, sometimes it's hard. You know, monthly, I don't have adrenaline juicing through my veins. I don't have that level of excitement in my life. So sometimes I think maybe the boredom gets to me, uh, the mundaneness of, of what I'm doing day in and day out. So. You know, that might be a contributor to it as well. Part of what nobody understood when MMA first started was what it took to do it. I mean, it goes back to the ridiculous where uh, you remember one of the UFC events where a guy has a boxing glove on and a bare hand. You know, that gives you an idea of like nobody knew what to expect when you're in the octagon. So part of what I was prepared to do was I didn't know what I was going to get into but I'm going to make myself as big and as strong as I possibly can. Um, up to the age of 27 I hadn't touched any PEDs at all. Um, I went through all my Olympics, all my NCA stuff, you know, no taking no chemicals whatsoever and I think part of it for me was out a little bit of the fear of not knowing what was going to happen or not knowing what was going to take place. Um, I went ahead and experimented with, um, with anabolics and androgenics. You know, my first fights down in Brazil, I was on just a very small dose of an anabolic, which is different than an androgenic. Androgenic is like a testosterone. Anabolics affect more of the muscle mass. When I went into the UFC, I thought it was stepping up a, a whole nother gear. And so my first UFC fights, I mean, I was, you know, I was probably 275 pounds with you know, 5% body fat, you know, could bench press a small car, you know, could squat, you know, a small house, you know, and it was like, it was just totally overkill. CG didn't, you know, I, rem I remember uh, for my first UFC fights, they had faxed over my blood work. I forgot to bring it and they had faxed it over. And I remember sitting across the table from the doctor and the doctor looking at my liver enzymes. And when you do anabolic steroids and you do them in high amounts, it, it messes with your liver enzymes. And I remember him looking at my liver enzymes and just like looking at me and looking at me and looking at the liver enzymes and going, do you realize that this is like eight times the normal amount you're supposed to have? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I just want you to be aware of that. And I'm like, okay, I'm aware of it. And that was it. You know, and you just go on and, you know, they allow you to fight. I think Pride just wanted the finished product. They didn't really particularly care how it got there. You know, they wanted you to look good. They wanted you to perform well, but they didn't particularly care if you, you know, ended up taking X, Y, and Z to get in the ring and look good and give them a good performance. They never questioned whether or not my blood pressure was too high. They never questioned whether or not my weight was too much or too little. Um, they just wanted the end product. That's it. Part of the understanding is the, as I progressed in the sport, understanding that that wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary to be, you know, 275 pounds, a muscle that had the lung capacity of a, of a hamster, you know? So, you know, as it progressed, it just tapered off to where, you know, by the end of it, I wasn't doing any anabolics at all because it wasn't even necessary uh, for the competitions. When I was 20 years old, I was on scholarship at Syracuse University and I had lost my scholarship uh, academically. Um, I just wasn't progressing as a student. 
Um, so the university had asked me to take a year off of school. And in that year's time, I ended up working out at the state fairgrounds in Syracuse, New York, uh, pulling cables for the bands that were coming in. Now the whole time as we were progressing and the bands getting bigger and bigger, the introduction to, you know, narcotics, there's cocaine and, you know, a bunch of different stuff around at the time. And uh, I started experimenting a little bit then with it. Taking cocaine for the first time is, you know, the sense of euphoria and alertness. It almost feels like you have Spider-Man senses. Like I can hear an ant walk across, you know, the floor from 30 feet away and I can smell, you know, I can smell you two blocks away. And, you know, it's just a huge sense of euphoria. You know, I mean, I, I liked cocaine because of the feeling it gave me. Um, but later on, as, as things progressed, it became less and less attractive. And um, as I started to get into, uh, you know, high levels of competition, the thing that my body wanted was it didn't want to feel pain. So eventually, you know, it switched to where, you know, I used narcotics, um, you know, like Vicodin and, and stuff like that. You know, not taking enough Vicodin where I'm a zombie out there in just a punching bag. Um, but, you know, through the years of competing, I have competed at less than I would consider my top level because of the narcotic use. You know, there's doctors that I had met that were, you know, that were junkies that wanted the meds just as bad as I did, that were willing to write scripts if I gave them half of the medication. And it wasn't as heavily uh, monitored and regulated as, as it is now. Um, so, you know, 10, you know, 12, 13 years ago, you know, it was a heck of a lot easier for a doctor to write, you know, me 180 pills with 10 refills, you know, in a pharmacy not to even blink twice about it. And it became prescription abuse. And then from abuse, it became addiction. And then once, once you turn that corner, once you cross that invisible line, there, there's no going back. You know, it was, you know, the prescription, uh, narcotics and then you mix stuff with it you mix alcohol with it and it just turns into a sloppy sloppy existence but the genesis of all this for me starts back when i was fighting and just the amount of you know pressure i put on myself to perform and you know not to seek healthy ways to to do rehab for my body wanting the instant you know relief of a sore shoulder you know take a couple of vicodin I can train later on that day, you know, take a couple of Vicodin and I can go to the gym later on. And the culmination of that was, uh, you know, when I fought uh, the no contest with Igor Volchanchin. I was in no condition to fight. Um, I had, had crossed the line between uh, taking pain medications as prescribed and abusing it and from abusing it to being addicted to it. Sometimes a camera, sometimes a camera should be on and it's not. You know, there's probably some things that, you know, but it's a point where, you know. The film crew was just starting to do uh, the smashing machine, and all this was going on at the time. So once we got back to Phoenix, they were like, hey, putting the camera down as your friend, you know, you need, you need help. And I, I was like, no, I don't need help. They're like, you need help. And from there, it progressed into me um, understanding that I had a problem, understanding that, um, that it wasn't going to go away by itself. Um, that I needed help. It wasn't a it wasn't a single person fight. I needed people around me, a support team, um, to help me fight this disease. Explain where we're going right now. Um, this is the halfway house that I stayed in uh, for like uh, six months, and uh, it's just a transitional place. Um, you know, to help you kind of balance uh, when you're when you get newly recovered, you know, from alcohol or drug addiction. You know, it's an environment where there's accountability, and uh, there's you know people there to help support you and things like that. How's it feel coming back to this halfway house again, Mark? <laughs> it's it's weird. It's still weird. <laughs> You know, it's a good thing. I mean, they exist, they exist for a reason, you know. And they're, you know, that's a fine line. Like halfway houses are a fine line between being a tool and being a crutch, you know. And, 
you know, a lot of times if you don't, you know, work your way out from this situation, it becomes a crutch, you know, where things here are easy because you're kind of sheltered from the real world, you know. And so if you use it as a tool, you know, it'll allow you to get to the next part of your recovery. You know, if you use it as a crutch, you can stay here a year. You know, there's no time limits. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll let you stay here as long as you want. You know, in your recovery, if you're, you know, if you're full of shit, you know, you, you had somebody there to tell you, you're full of shit. You know, if, you did, if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you had somebody there to call you out on it, you know. And, um, you know, just like with fighting and wrestling and all that stuff, it works much better with a mentor. You know, same thing with recovery. You know, it works much better when you have somebody that has made it through the hard parts of recovery. And it's a fight. I mean, you know, any kind of addiction wants to kill you. It doesn't matter if it's bulimia, doesn't matter if it's anorexia, it doesn't matter if it's gambling, you know, whatever the addiction is, the end result, it's, 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 that's why they say most, all diseases have a pathology. They have a beginning, you can trace it, and it has a distinct pathology, and at the end of all that pathology is death, you know? Alcohol wants to kill you, you know? All this wants to kill you, it's just the way it is. So you said you was homeless on the streets for a little bit, or? Yeah, um, they have another house called Sarayan, which is in Mesa. And um, when I told them that I'd have the uh, rent due, I didn't have it. And immediately it's, you have to get out of the house. So there was about uh, two weeks where just trying to figure out what to do next, you know? And then a buddy of mine that lives out in Mesa, um, finally I got frustrated enough and I said, okay, I need to ask for help, you know? And I had called up my uh, friend of mine named Darren and I just said to Darren, Darren, I need, he's like, buddy, just, you know, grab whatever you need to grab. Come on over. I got a place for you to crash. And you're sleeping in a car? Sleeping in that car. Right. Yeah. You guys are in the back seat. There's enough room, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty big dude, though. I know. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you got to open the windows. Do you, you want to go through your, uh, your car lot where you work? Yeah, come on. Every time they entered the ring, you know, I had a routine and it was a lot of this shaking and it was a lot of this jumping and getting ready and shaking your legs out. You've already gone through your pre-warm up. You know, and part of uh, part of coming into work, sometimes you can get in that same mentality, you know, where I'm coming to work and, you know, I'm shaking out, I'm getting ready, I'm jumping and getting ready to get in the ring. Almost every single fight that you've ever seen even in the ring, I'm sitting there shaking out and shaking out and shaking out and jumping, doing these little jumps, getting ready to fight. And it just keys your body into knowing. And so here at work, you can key yourself mentally, because obviously I can't beat customers up, but you can key yourself in mentally that it's a little bit different war. It's an emotional, uh, it's an emotional war. There's nothing in your day-to-day -day life that's gonna replace the adrenaline that I felt when, before I got into the ring. So, you look for other things that might be able to do it. You know, one of the things is when you make a good sale and say so you make a commission that's a $2,000 commission that's gonna pay you. Sometimes there's adrenaline doing that. You know, but that doesn't happen often enough. <laughs> you know, for me, I have uh, regrets, you know, regret Regret um, selling cards to feed my family is not one of them. You know, uh, you know, selling cards to be able to provide a, a nice home for my son to live in or a nice school to go to, that's not a regret. You know, obviously do I think that my talents could be directed someplace else and I could be more beneficial? Yeah. You know, I feel like sometimes doing anything other than wrestling or mixed martial arts or something around that, it feels like I'm a fish out of water. You know, I have 30 years of knowledge in my head of stuff, how to train, how to get ready for events, techniques, you know, wrestling techniques, jiu-jitsu techniques, sambo, judo techniques. I have all of this information, just not the proper format to share it in. So sometimes I feel, maybe not regret that I'm working here, just kind of, uh, you know, feel like they're, I, they're, that my talents are gone unused. You know, I think that's a better way to describe it. You know, I'm coming up on uh, on a year of sobriety, which you know, for me, it's 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 a pretty big mild marker. You know, as far as what the future holds, you know, I mean, 
you know, part of recovery is, you know, I'm just trying to do what I need to do today. Whether or not 10 years or 20 years from now, I don't know if I'll be sober or not. But I'm only trying to be sober for one minute, one second at a time. You know, some days are harder than others, um, just like anything else. It's almost like, you know, there is this feeling inside that, I, that you have to shed instantly, which is a feeling of like, you know, I've been down this road before, I've done this before, and here I am again, I'm faced with the same challenges again, and it's, it's one, it's, it's like if I was fighting diabetes or I was fighting cancer, you know, it's the same type of, type of situation. You know, like I said over and over again, there's a pathology, so I look at it like I have a disease, I know what the cure is. You know, and I have to continue to take my medicine no matter what. You know, I have to continue to participate in a high level in my recovery. Otherwise, I get sick again. You know, it's pretty easy to look at my son. And, you know, he's a, you know, he's an awesome kid, good-looking dude. And uh, you know, I didn't have to search very far to come up with the reasons to get clean and sober. You know, he's gonna need his dad. You know. He's gonna need his dad around for as long as I possibly can be, so. Yes. Okay. What do you want to do? 